Okay, welcome again uh, to our Form of Faith class. Um, good to see all of you back. Sometimes through classes, you know, people kind of, you know, drop off uh, here or there. You never know. And uh, so I uh, hope you found as well, if you have had to, to miss a Wednesday, that we do have the videos up uh, on our YouTube site. So it's a separate playlist called Form of Faith. And we'll leave those up there forever. And uh, hello, I know we have some other people extended family and people have been watching as well so i may not know you but thanks for uh, tuning in to us as well so we're on page 47 uh there in your form of faith booklet and so now we're going to start with baptism let's uh, open first with a word of prayer and then we will dive right in the lord be with you let us pray oh god you see that of ourselves we have no strength and so by your mighty power defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Bless us as well this Lenten season that we may keep the fast, recognizing our sin and coming before you as you absolve, equip us for every good work, and point us as well to a glorious future that yet awaits. All this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm going to kind of stand off to the side here, wherever you can best see the board. So we talk about, you know, form of faith, path of salvation, that sort of thing. And, and I hope by now you're, while you have learned a lot, that you see as well that it's, it's actually pretty simple. <laughs> and, and even the more I learn and grow in God's word, the more it's like, duh, it's kind of right in front of me. It's kind of right there. And so as humans and as sinners, we always want to make things a little more complicated than what scripture actually gives them to us. So let's just kind of start with some basics that we've learned already. All are sinful, unclean, and fall short of God's doxa. That's glory, where the word doxology comes from. Okay? True or false? Are all people sinful? Yes. Born sinful, unclean, fallen short of the glory of God? Okay? Okay, yep, that's absolutely correct. Second one. All are justified by God's grace in Christ Jesus. Did Jesus shed his blood for the sins of the whole world? Did Jesus die for the whole world? Right? So you could go John 3.16, For God so loved the perfect people who got it all figured out. <laughs> for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Okay, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 3, 21 to 26, I've quoted a few of those passages in that, but uh, Romans is a, is a great book if you haven't spent time reading through that. Uh, chapter 3, if you don't want to read the whole book, start with chapter 3, okay? So yes, all are justified by God's grace in Christ, but will all be saved, or in the sense, will all people believe? No, they won't, okay? So saved, question mark. Who then will be saved? Those who have faith. Okay, or the verb, if you will, believe. Okay, and remember, as we've learned quite clearly from Scripture, that faith itself is God's gift. That's what grace is all about. That He gives now the ability to believe. That's why no one can say Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. And that's why we confess, you know, uh, in the midst of, um, you know, we finished up the Creed. And if you go through and look at some of the explanation to the creed, we finished up the Holy Spirit last week. So the third article, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, come to Jesus Christ my Lord, or believe in Him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. Right? Faith comes from hearing the word. Enlighten me with his gifts. Sanctified, remember that word we learned? Holified, sanctification, to be made holy. Sanctified and kept me, keeps me in the one true faith. So faith now, salvation, is all God's work. And scripture repeatedly, not a work of man. Okay? Now when we get to the last class session, I'll, we'll go through kind of mainline denominations, and we'll talk about the formal principle and material principle. Because not all, quote, Christians necessarily believe what we've learned already from Scripture. 
that justification is done solely by Christ, the work of saving is done solely by Christ, and the ability even for you to believe is not done by you, but by the Holy Spirit who lives in you and enables you to do that. Okay? So there are some nuances there, and that's why you'll see some differences amongst Christian churches, how they worship, how they practice and do things, who they might give baptism to, who they might. Okay? Lord's Supper, how is it treated? What about the role of pastors? Okay, what do they play? Okay, so we'll make sure we cover some of that before we're done with this class. But it all comes down to faith. Okay, God's gift, not a work of man. Faith now grabs hold of, very simply, these things. One, that through faith, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to you. That's a big fancy theological term. Right. If you want to say injected, you can say injected whatever word you want to use, but the righteousness of Christ is now given to you by faith. So think of it this way. You die today. And as we've learned from Scripture, you go one of two places. You either have faith and go to heaven, or you don't have faith and you perish eternally in hell. Okay? Pretty simple. But now, go into heaven. Okay? And you've heard all the jokes, and this is nowhere in the Bible. But before you actually get to heaven, you know, the jokes go, you have to stand there at St. Peter's pearly gates. Right? And St. Peter's looking down on you with his big judge robe and his gavel, right? And, uh, hey, you! You think you deserve to go in here? And of course you're a person of faith, you say, no, I don't, I don't deserve to go to heaven. Well, why should I let you in? Because Christ stands for me, right? And even a better analogy than that, because I really don't like the St. Peter Gates, but you've all heard that joke, is that God now does not see you in your sin when he looks at you. Who does he see? He sees Jesus. That's a marvelous thought. Think about that. He sees Jesus. He sees the righteousness of his Son. Okay, that, that now has, has changed your standing before him. Okay, and, and now it gets even better, and we're going to get into this tonight, baptism. So just as now through faith there's imputed righteousness, and someone who now has faith in Jesus Christ, he's the son of God, he saved me from my sins, that simple faith, even the size of a mustard seed, is enough to save. Okay, but God doesn't stop there. He said, I have more gifts I want to give you that are going to be so beneficial for you. The first one we're going to talk about tonight is baptism. And now instead of just this imputed righteousness, which does save, now there's going to be a covering of righteousness. A clothing, a garment of righteousness. Think of Joseph from the Old Testament, his technicolor dream coat, right? That he was given, uh, that his father gave him to... Uh, to single him out from his brothers, but in a very spiritual way. Okay? Because he believed God now had promised that he would be a, a prophet. Okay? And the, the, the all tied to the promise of the Messiah that was to come. Baptism also is adoption. Because God gives you his name. And remember, children can initiate adoption. Right? I mean, if so, I don't know that we would have many orphanages anymore. The kids would just run around, tag, you're it. You're going to be my mom. And you're like, what? So, God the Father initiates adoption. And not only that, now in baptism, there's also the promise of an inheritance. Because you're part of the family tree. How many of you done the 23andMe or the uh, DNA genealogy? It's, it's pretty amazing. I, I, I've thought about, as I get older, <laughs> Pastor Feeney, who's retired in, in Colorado now, he's really big on genealogy and you know, in, in my younger years, you know, I always found older people want to talk about where you're from, who you're related to, you know, trying to chase that down. I was like, that's really annoying. You know, and now that I'm older, getting older, I'm like, that's really fascinating. You know, the family connections and that sort of thing. And so now in baptism, you're attached to that family tree. Okay? And you might say in faith now, even imputed with holy DNA of Jesus, right? I just kind of made that up. Don't take that too far. Okay, because you're still going to need a new body, of course. Your, your DNA is sinful, don't misunderstand. 
And then absolution. There's spoken righteousness. Okay? So, guys with this uniform, okay, um, are called as servants to speak for Christ. Okay? When you hear Pastor McKay or Pastor Grady on Sunday morning say, I forgive you all your sins, don't think that that's Marcus McKay or Jim Grady that is doing that. What you need to think and believe is that they're just the mouthpiece speaking on behalf of Jesus. So whose voice do you actually hear? Jesus. Jesus. And what is he saying? I forgive you. And we're going to cover that because that's what Jesus told his disciples to go do. So when people go visit churches, other Christian churches, and, and if you do bring me a bulletin, I'd love to see what other people do or send me some links or whatever. But I always have a few questions. Do they talk about baptism? Do they talk about what Jesus did? That he actually died on the cross for you? I mean, or is it just kind of a life lesson? Baptism reference? Does the pastor speak the words of Christ? I forgive you all your sins. Simple questions. That's called the Viva Vox Christe. That's the living voice of Christ. Because he still speaks through his church in an orderly way. And then, of course, the Lord's Supper. All through the Bible. Pay attention as you read your Bible. Meals are a big deal. Eating is a big deal. This Sunday, we're going we're gonna to hear about the Israelites in the wilderness. Okay? And God rescued them from Egypt in a miraculous way. Okay? And, but they're hungry, and they're thirsty. And what does God do? He feeds them. Right? Manna from heaven, living bread. And the gospel we're going to have for this coming Sunday is way pay attention to this, because Jesus had a couple of very, well, more than a couple of very important feedings. Feeding of 5,000, feeding of 7,000, out of just a little bit of bread and a few fish, right? Um, that is now miraculously for everybody. And so there's a meal, there's a food of righteousness. And so the church always now, you know, celebrated what Christ mandated and gave, which is all part of Holy Week, Right? So it's all part of the Lord's Supper. Take, eat, take, drink. This is my body. This is my blood. And don't worry, we'll get into that here in another lesson. Okay. Any questions on this very simple, I tried to condense it in a simple way as possible, okay, of our condition, what God has done through Christ, what he gives, the power that he imputes, and, is, and, and now faith that grabs hold of the things that he says to do and that you need. Can we baptize? Sure. Us? Oh. Sure. Um, <laughs> and we I'm going to, we're going to get to that in the lesson. So I'm going to have you hold that as an excellent question. And before we finish this lesson, if I haven't answered that, throw something at me. <coughs> Excuse me. Coffee went down the wrong windpipe. Any other questions before we dive into baptism? Okay, here we go. Page 47. What is the basic difference between a sacrament and a sacrifice? Answer, let's read it together. A sacrifice is something we do for God. A sacrament is something God does for us. How do we define a sacrament? Let's read it together. A sacrament is a sacred act instituted by God himself in which there are certain visible means connected with God's word by which God offers, gives, and seals to us the forgiveness of sins, which Christ earned through his life, death, and resurrection. Okay, I'm going to erase the board. So when we talk about the word sacrament, if you open the back of your Bible, will you find, and there's an index back there, or a concordance, and you look up the word sacrament, will you find it? Not unless you have a Latin Bible. Okay? One of the first translations of the Bible was into Latin, okay? um, out of the Hebrew and the Greek. Okay? And we're going to cover this passage, but I'm just going to break it down real simple. And it doesn't just occur in the, the verse I'm going to give to you. Paul writes, Men ought to consider us as stewards, wardens, of the mysteries of God. Okay? So the word mystery is from the Greek word mysterion. Take a wild guess what word that is in Latin. 
Mystery. Sacrament. Oh, it's a oh, I know. I told. I warned you earlier. I said it's really simple. It's sacrament. The mystics. So the word mystery, mystery, is Latin is the word sacrament. Okay. So this is is not a word necessarily that we've we've invented. It's just a, a Latin word that is translated out of it. Okay. Now we could still say the mystery of baptism, the mystery of the Lord's Supper, the mystery of absolution. Okay. Because to be honest. It is a complete mystery in some ways, meaning that you cannot rationally, scientifically explain it. You mean when the pastor says, I forgive you all your sins, if that's actually Jesus speaking? How am I supposed to, what am I supposed to do with that? Believe, because right? he says so. Faith, that's exactly right. Same thing with baptism. <gasps> baptism saves me? Covers me with Jesus' righteousness? I can't, you know, what do I need to, 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 to go into the hospital and I need to have a full body scan like they do for cancer cells and all these other things and try and figure out if there's some mystical covering? You won't find it. Faith. Why? Because God says so. Same thing with the Lord's Supper. Jesus says this is, este, is my body, this is my blood. This bread is my body, this blood, this wine is my blood. And we're like, boy... We know your wife makes that bread every Saturday night, and it sure tastes good. We like it, and the wine, I mean, I can buy that wine from my local liquor store. You're telling me that's the body and blood of Jesus? Yeah? Well, I sent that off for scientific analysis, and it came back as just regular bread and wine. How can you say that? Jesus said so. God said so. He imputed it. I believe it. Yeah. Okay? Like so we just take him, take him at his word. So, for something to be now, okay? And this is, this is now what we see in Scripture. Three things to be now a sacrament or a mystery. Um, number one, it's instituted by God. And I actually like the word mandated better. Okay? Instituted by God. Okay, that's the first one. Um, number two, there are what? Visible means. So in baptism, what's the visible uh, means? Water. Just water. Okay? Does it matter how much water? It actually doesn't. We'll talk about that. Okay? I would prefer... I, I, know, I know a pastor who... Um, he puts plastic down around the baptismal font. Okay? And when, and when somebody gets baptized, whether an adult or a kid, he just throws water on them like crazy. Okay, and I, I attended once, and I saw. I said, "Dude, you just need to get a get a baptistry in there. I mean, just get a, a swimming pool or something." He's like, "That's too expensive. <laughs> it's so much easier." But but you know, lots of water. It doesn't matter how much water. Okay, the Jordan River where Jesus baptized is actually not very deep, and historically has not been very deep. Okay, we don't know that Jesus was even fully submerged when he was baptized. Okay, but we'll get into that here in the lesson. Number three. What's the third thing? God's word. What's that? God's word. Uh, giving what? God's word giving what? Forgiveness. Very good. I'm just going to write forgiveness of sins to keep it simple. Okay? Forgiveness of sins is now given, um, offered, assured that there is now forgiveness of sins that is given. Okay? And of course, that's needed. Do you sin daily? I do. Do you keep the Ten Commandments perfectly? Nope. nope. There's only one guy that did that. His name is Jesus, right? So there's, there's only one. Um, and, and while that law is, is good for us to, to show for the sake of repentance and for, for good living here, we need the forgiveness of sins. And so God gives now these mysteries, sacraments, if you will, okay? And this is now what defines them. So the first one we're going to look at is baptism. How many sacred acts fit this definition? Only two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Although we'll get to absolution. So I already mentioned when a pastor says, I forgive you, what's missing? Okay, when a pastor speaks those words, I forgive you all your sins on behalf of Christ. He's right, the emissary, he's the under-shepherd of Christ. Which one of these three is missing from absolution? Number two. Number two. 
Yeah, there's no visible means. I mean, Jesus sends the apostles out to do it. They continue to practice it, teach pastors to do it, so on and so forth now, almost 2,000 years later. Okay? Martin Luther famously said that if the church was really, really cold, and you could see the pastor's breath, <laughs> he was kind of joking. He might have had a couple of beers because he did enjoy his beer. Um, you know, so... Absolution, confession absolution, is often referred to as the Lutheran third sacrament. But technically it doesn't follow under this definition. Okay, So two, three sacraments, as long as you understand what's going on. Okay, when did God institute baptism? Uh, well, let's, let's start on the right side. Whoever wants want to go at this table, and we'll catch up to you guys in the back. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Okay, somewhere in the, the uh, middle 19th century, maybe just a little later than that, this kind of became called the Great Commission. Um, and, and that's fine, um, you know, but, but the important part of it is this is Jesus now giving to his apostles before he ascends into heaven, giving to his church, mandating, go, this is imperative in the Greek, go, emphatic, go and make disciples of all nations. How are disciples going to be made? Let's raffle off a Harley every Sunday or maybe a bass boat. Or maybe we'll just fly over with helicopters and planes and, 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 and drop a check, you know, for $100. But you got to show up at church to cash it. And we'll try and get disciples these ways. How are disciples going to be made, Jesus says, first and foremost? Baptizing. What are his words? Baptizing them. Baptizing them, okay, which we're going to look at what that word means to apply water. But in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There's God's name again, okay? And he didn't stop there. Now, the second thing that continues, and that's why I'm so appreciative of you coming to a class like this, and I would have hope not only for those of you, the few of you that are already members, but those of you that are, are now going to not only join with us, but, but growing in your Christian faith, that you won't stop studying and learning. Because what did Christ command of the church to teach? So there's, there's continual learning, okay? So teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Okay, so especially now that which he has commanded, commanded, instituted, mandated. That's why you hear us. I know sometimes you're like, why do you pastors talk about baptism and absolution, Lord? You seem to talk about it ad nauseum. <laughs> Jesus told us to, and I'm wearing this thing. Okay, but that, that wasn't fair because I really enjoy telling people about that. <laughs> okay, so it's not really work on my part. It's, it's great joy. Because I truly believe that forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation come through this form of faith that God has given to us. Okay? Alright? And then Jesus promises now in the midst of that, in the midst now of this sacrament, in the midst of this teaching, I am with you always to the end of the age. I don't know about you, but there's some days I really feel like I could use a little more Jesus in my life. Had a few days like that? Mm -hmm. World going to H-E double hockey sticks in a, in a hand basket, you know what I mean? And Jesus says, hey, I'm with you. How do you know he's with you? Awesome. Are you baptized? Do you have faith? I mean, these are the things you come back to and you cling to. The devil wants you to look elsewhere to find your peace and comfort. But Christians find their peace and comfort with, with what God's word says. Okay, next question. What does the word baptize mean? Simply means to wash or apply water by immersing, washing, pouring, etc. This word occurs other places in the Bible. Did you know that? Mark 7, verse 4. Who's next? When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. Yeah, it's just a, you know, I'm not going to go into the context here of Mark 7, which is some, some uh, uh, um, rituals within uh, Judaism. Okay, but it's, it's the same word, it just means to wash, to apply water. Uh, let's go to the back table, Matthew 3, verse 11. I baptize you with water for repentance, 
But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Yeah. So look at the. Go back up to Matthew 28, 25 uh, 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 chapters before. So early on in his ministry, and Jesus always has a way of doing this. You know, he's always kind of foretelling. I don't know how many of you were able to be here last night for Pastor Oman's excellent sermon, right? And so <laughs> Jesus is telling Peter and the disciples, hey, look, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed. Um, he's going to be crucified. He's going to die. And on the third day, he's going to rise again, right? I mean, and, and you, when you read the Gospels and you go back and look for that, you're like, they should have got all this. I mean, they should have. If they were paying attention at all to their rabbi, their teacher, they would have picked up on that, okay? Um, but they either ignored it, <laughs> denied it, which is what Peter did. But thankfully, God's grace and mercy is still there. So Jesus in Matthew 3, you know, I baptize you with water, or this is John the Baptist saying this, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me, and John the Baptist was the last prophet. There have been no more prophets since John the Baptist. Je Jesus himself says he's the last and greatest prophet, Okay. Um, he who is coming after me is mightier than I, sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So now there will be uh, the baptism now that, that, that Jesus gives <laughs> is amazing because the Holy Spirit now is attached by Jesus' promise. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, um, and, and fire now as well, and this is for the, for the rest of the apostles especially, not only tongues of fire in Pentecost... Okay, uh, but now fire in terms of, you know, fan into flame the gift that's been given you, this faith that is there. And so references of the Holy Spirit will normally be in the form of a dove that descended upon Jesus at his own baptism, okay, um, and um, or, you know, fire, okay, uh, whether it's tongues of fire for Pentecost uh, or just in general that way. Okay, Acts 22, verse 16. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Wow. That's kind of, you can go back and look at the context, but it's, it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty amazing that baptizing here, as they're using it, of course, is with water, is with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what happens in baptism? Sins are washed away. Okay? So you, you've got it right there in Scripture. And, of course, calling on his name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? Um, through whom does the church administer baptism? Let's come back. Yep. Uh, this is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And there's the verse I promised you is coming, 1 Corinthians 4.1. Underline or highlight that word mysteries. In Latin, that's sacrament, where the word comes from. The mysteries, and it's plural. So it's not just one. So Paul is teaching the Corinthians, you know, how do you look at me and all the rest of the pastors here are starting these churches. Because as Paul would travel, you know, he took all these missionary journeys. It's really fascinating. And, and what he would do is he would, he would find people that would listen and become believers. And there'd be baptism and, 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 all, and catechesis. All the stuff you're doing, just like this. To start a church in that area. And then, and then you know, he would, he would send or raise up men who would be trained that would be pastors there. He'd go on to the next place. And so on and so forth. And then he, he kept writing letters. We have a lot of those in the New Testament to these various churches. The Ephesians, the Corinthians, the Colossians, the Galatians. You know, words of instruction, right? As they're, as they're young churches growing uh, in the faith, right? Um, and how do, how, do you, how, do you, how do you look at me, the Apostle Paul? And how do you look at, you know, Timothy um, or these other young pastors? You look at us as servants of Christ, that's the uniform, okay, if you will, okay, and stewards of the mysteries of God, right? So easy way to think of steward or stewardess. I haven't done much flying in the last couple of years because of COVID, um, but I like flying. I like it when someone asks me if I'd like a drink and some peanuts. That's awesome. <laughs> and they're stewards of these gifts, and they roll this little cart down the aisle, right? And they have wonderful little libations there. I mean, I can have a, a Diet Coke or a Sprite. I can have a hot cup of coffee. I can have bourbon. I can have a, a you know, a, a Pinot Noir. I can have, you know, they, they're, but they're stewards of all this, right? 
and they'll also cut you off if you drink too much. Probably. I'm not telling you that from experience. I've seen them happen. They're stewards of how many peanuts you can have. Okay? Thankfully, there's always someone around you who doesn't like the pretzels or peanuts. So if you really like them, you can probably get some extra ones. But they're stewards of them. Now, that seems kind of silly, but pastors now are the stewards of these gifts to baptize. We hold them on behalf of the church. Okay? Um, uh, we don't hoard them as in trying to keep them from you. We're giving them out in a good and appropriate way, you see. So that's how you should look as your pastors, not as, you know, they're in charge of everything. And especially in the Lutheran church, when I was down in Arkansas, you know, uh, they, they hadn't had a Lutheran church where we were at. And so the Baptists and Pentecostals and Assembly of God and Church of Christ, some of them weren't sure what to do with us when we kind of showed up there. Because we looked a little Roman Catholic, but we certainly didn't sound Roman Catholic and do all the Roman Catholic things, okay? But the other thing that was different was that when I would go and meet with these other pastors or other people, you know, they're like, well, you guys got 10 acres of land. You're doing pretty well, Pastor McKay. And I'm like, I don't own that. What? You don't own those 10 acres there off Highway 5 in Bryant, Arkansas? Which is really good land? No. The church owns that. <laughs> they just called me to be their shepherd. That's, that's what I do. Really? What about all the money from the offering? I don't even count it. We have people that count that money. I, I don't... You're one of the counters. Every Monday morning, there's four or five guys that sit in this room right over here, and they count everything up, and they fill out all the reports and give it to the office. Okay? Um, all I see is kind of a report of, of how much came in. Right? So, do you understand a little bit of that? I mean, so this concept of a steward now, I mean, it's very orderly. Okay? Uh, who is to be baptized? So we, we did Matthew 20, 19. Let's not read that again. Go to Acts 2, 38 to 39. Question. Yeah, please. Is this the right time to ask your question? You can ask. Oh, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're, you're a good... What was the question again? Can anybody <laughs> baptize? Can anybody oh, baptize? yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, 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 yes. So let, let's answer it real quick, okay? Yes, anyone can baptize. Who normally should baptize? The pastor. The stewards. Yes. Right? Because we have scripture that talks about that. Mm -hmm. But with baptism, it's the, it's the power of the word of God. Mm -hmm. So here's what I would encourage you. Um, and I, I have had members, and I, I've tried to teach this over the years, and I, um, I've had it happen a few times where, you know, um, there's been a birth at a hospital, and the child was in distress. And the dad uh, or somebody called me and said, you know, pastor, the kid's here, but it's not good. You know, can I baptize them? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Get a little bit of water that's readily available. You know, just just apply water. <laughs> okay, don't drown the little crap, the little kid. <laughs> that was that, I didn't mean it that way. Don't drown the little baby. I mean, but apply water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Anybody can do that. Or you come upon an accident scene. You know, um, and now, you know, we, we do have first responders in the congregation, um, you know, and you'd be surprised how many people that are facing death sometimes will think spiritually. Mm -hmm. And the Lord may place you in a situation where that's, you might get in a conversation you never expected to get into. Okay. Um, and I mean, I, I just, I don't think about it because it's, it's part of what I do, obviously, on a daily basis. But, but, you know, I like to ask people, you know, are you, are you, are you a fellow Christian? You know, do you go to church anywhere? You know, what do you believe? Uh, and I try and be very winsome about that. And I don't try and beat people over the head, you know, with, with the faith. But it's just an opportunity to start conversation uh, and to find out. And so, yeah. So, but normally we would do it in church. Okay. Um, you know, so when you have children, you know, you, and we're, we're going to get into this now in the rest of the text. Okay. <clears throat> we try and baptize them as soon as possible. You know, the next soon as mom's able to come to church with the baby, okay? And sometimes because of RSV, you know, we had a lot of baptisms during COVID where it was just kind of a private affair for obvious reasons, especially with little kids, you know, over the winter, like I said, RSV season, that sort of thing, totally get it. Um, and they could have done the baptism at home, but they came to church and wanted us pastors to do it. Why? Because they believe what we're reading here, 
So emergency, that would be the word. In the case of an emergency, absolutely. How do you do it then? How do you do it? Water. Take some water. Mm -hmm. Apply some water on the forehead, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. And in the name of the Father, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Jesus just said to apply water. We typically will pour water. I just use my hand. Some pastors will use a, um, a, a shell, a baptismal shell. Um, I just use my hand. Pour water on your forehead. Right? We're going to practice this in two weeks, right? On April 7th. You know, water on the forehead. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? Um, so, does it, again, does it matter how much water? No. I would love to have a permanent baptismal font that also has a small uh, pool. So that if somebody desired to be immersed, they could be. doesn't matter how much water. I love the symbolism of immersion, of being covered completely by water. Okay, but it's not required. Scripture does not say how much water is to be used. Matter of fact, the verb of Jesus' baptism, when he was baptism, when he was baptized, the Greek as it translates, is not that he came up from within the water, but he basically came up from the water. That's a small nuance unless you really study language. So we don't know that Jesus was completely immersed. So when you talk to other, there are Christians, Southern Baptists, and others, and I'll, I'll get into the denominational stuff a little later, <laughs> that would say, unless you've been immersed by baptism, they have made that now a man-made law. That your baptism, you Roman Catholics, you Lutherans, and, and Presbyterians, and even Methodists, who just put water on the forehead, that's not enough water. Not a valid baptism. And I've got a good Southern Baptist friend, and, you know, um, love him to death, but, you know, he continues to remind me, in his opinion, that I'm not truly saved yet. Because I never really invited Jesus into my heart, and I've never been immersed in my baptism. Okay. Now, we love each other to death, but he's pretty firm on a few things he believes. We served in, on Rotary. We started a new Rotary Club uh, uh, down in Bryant. Uh, good guy. Back on the baptism. Okay, yeah, yeah, please. So, let, let's just say, you happen upon a car accident, you go up. The yep. person is obviously passing, but they're still coherent. And they request baptism, or they don't. If they don't, is there any response? I mean, they have to believe, right? Yeah, normally, well, again, baptism is God's work, but obviously with adults, we're dealing with, with those who are able to, you know, be taught. But now you're in a situation where death might be imminent. So mm -hmm. here's, here's what I've done, mm -hmm. and I actually have done this before, just so you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, coming up into a situation like that, mm -hmm. um, and um, I'll, I'll use a better one. I had a... I had a uh, a gentleman that was at a, a nursing home, mm -hmm. and uh, he would wheel into the back on a Sunday afternoon and listen to the short little chapel service that I did. He would never come and join the group, and he never wanted the large print little hymnal that we would pass out, but he would just wheel in the doorway, you know, and every time I'd try and catch him afterwards, by the time I was done, he'd already wheeled off down the hallway, okay? And um, so many, many moons later, um, I have one of the orderlies or nurses tug on my sleeve and said, do you know Mr. So-and-so, you know, who used to come? And I said, yeah. I said, he's sick. And he's actually in his room on hospice, hospice on palliative care. And um, he'd, like, he'd like to talk with you. I said, let's go. So I went down there and, you know, and, and um, he proceeded to kind of just, he confessed some sins. Obviously, I'm not going to divulge what he did. And, um, you know, and I just, I just briefly examined him and I said, you know, well, I mean, let's say his name was Bob, you know, Bob, you know, you, you, you're, you're troubled because of your sins and, and I've got great news for you. Jesus died for your sins. You know, you're forgiven brother, right? In the name of the father, son, and Holy spirit. And, uh, and, and, uh, you know, so, and then, and then we, you know, we, we talked, you know, so you believe in Jesus, you believe the words I just spoke. What do you believe Jesus did for you? He died on the cross for me, Pastor. Yeah, he did. And I said, well, who is Jesus? You know, and he just, we just kind of went through some basic stuff. 
Yeah. I mean, you guys have gone in depth, but you know, he confessed, you know, the triune God, and and uh -huh. um, and I said, I said, Bob, have you ever been baptized? He goes, I never, I, no. He goes, I, he goes, I, I've lived my life, you know, hating churches, and you know, organized religion, and he goes, and I, I was wrong. And uh, I, he said, he said, can I be baptized? I said, yeah, sure, you betcha. <laughs> and I baptized him there in his bed, and he, he died like the next day. Aww. So baptism gives assurances. Now, he already had faith, even before I came in the room, correct? Sure. Right. So I, I believe he, he would have been saved, even with that mustard seed of faith. Mm -hmm. But now the assurance and the comfort that, that receiving these gifts gave him, how much more for those of us that are yet alive? And not just for ourselves, for our children. To have that comfort, to be able to point to that, and to put God's word and say, hey, when baptism says my sins are washed away, boom, wow, that's huge. Baptism says I'm, I'm part of God's family tree. And, and I, I get some of the inheritance, the heavenly treasure. Wow, right? I mean, what great assurance. And that's why faith grabs hold of, grabs hold of and treasures what God gives. Okay. What, what is meant by born again? I'm sorry. What is meant by born People say they're born again. Born again. Well, born again, this would be from John chapter 3. And I think we, uh, we get into that text here real quick. I don't know if I put that one in here. Okay. Um, where are we at here? I thought that I had it in here. Oh, yeah. Here, let's just, let's just roll through some text and then we're ready for a break anyway. Um, okay, so do we do Acts 2? No, we didn't even do Matthew. Oh, do Acts 2. That's right. You're up for Acts 2. We didn't do Matthew yet. Uh, we, already did. we already did Matthew. Let's go to Acts 2. Okay. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So the promises of baptism are for who? You and your children. Okay? Um, so th this, is, this is most excellent, right? And, and remember, we've covered already that little children can have faith. They can have faith. Jesus says, right? Padaya, the little kids that are bounced upon a knee, don't cause one of them to sin. So faith now, the Holy Spirit, as he works faith, also works repentance as well. A little child may not have all the knowledge you do or understanding of sin, but faith and repentance can still be there. So repent, be baptized. Who? He doesn't single out just certain age groups or certain people. Every one of you. So some people say, well, the Bible doesn't explicitly say we're supposed to baptize babies. Um, you know, so to be born again means to make a decision when you're old enough to truly understand and repent. And I'm like, wait a minute. We've got text after text after text, which uses uh, the word I had up there for, all, A-L-L, -L, that uses every one of you, promise for you and for your children. The Bible doesn't differentiate based on age or status or anything else. It's for all people, period. So it's kind of a non-starter, if you will. So, you know, watch for those who would try and add to what Scripture says. All right? And then let's go to John 3, 5 to 6. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Yeah, now this, this is very interesting here. Okay? Now I would submit to you, that uh, when Jesus says one is born of water and the Spirit, he is now foreshadowing baptism. Mm -hmm. He's talking about baptism that he's going to later mandate. Remember, as I told you, Jesus, you know, leads up to a lot of things. He's always dropping little breadcrumbs, right? Pieces of candy for Hansel and Gretel to follow, right? All the way through. Um, and, and so there it is. One is born of water and the Spirit. Um, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. So in and of itself, remember, not by works, sinful flesh can't enter. But that which is born of the Spirit, the Spirit creates faith. The Spirit sanctifies. 
The spirit in baptism covers you with Jesus. That now is spirit. Okay. So are you saying that if someone is not baptized and dies, that they're not going to enter the kingdom of God? Okay, if I understand you, if I understood your correction your question correctly, I would say no, I'm not saying that. I would I would simply say what uh, scripture says uh, that whoever believes, this is Mark 16 verse 16, whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's the assurance and the promise. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. So, so maybe faith. I understood your question it's incorrectly. Faith. It's faith. That it's faith. Helps you enter the kingdom of God. But why would faith ever reject baptism? See, that's the kicker. Mm -hmm. Why would faith ever say that promise isn't for me and my children, mm -hmm. or it's my work? Right? Faith always humbles and receives what God does. See the difference in that? Yes. And and you know so so yes, it's certainly possible so that Bob, who I baptized, maybe aren't baptized yet. It's because their faith isn't, I don't want to say strong enough, because the mustard seed, but... Um, they may not have learned. They may not have been taught. Mm -hmm. um, they might have been falsely taught mm -hmm. that baptism does not depend upon the work of God through the Holy Spirit, but depends on my work, <laughs> my decision, my commitment, my understanding, my, 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 my. Look at the words that are being used here. As opposed to what scripture emphasized, right. the work of God, the work of the Spirit. See the difference there? And that's why we use scripture to interpret scripture. So I would say in Matthew chapter 3, is Jesus emphasizing baptism or not? Yes, he's emphasizing it, right? That that's all part of it. Why would you ever reject that for yourself or your children? Okay? All right, let's roll through a few more and then we'll take a break unless there's any burning questions. Psalm 51, verse 5, uh, uh, David, King David writes, behold, um, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. That's every single one of us. Brought forth in iniquity. We're, we're born into it, DNA. In sin did my mother conceive me. This isn't. He's not singing out his mom. His mom was some sort of a bad woman. This is just the nature of being a sinner. Okay? Uh, Mark 10. They were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them. This is an amazingly beautiful text, right? The disciples are like, these kids aren't old enough to understand what's going on. You know, they're crying, they're running around, their noses are runny, you know, blah, 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 blah. And uh, Jesus gets upset with them. Let them come to me. Don't hinder them. And then look at the phrase, kingdom of God. And look at how the phrase kingdom of God has been used in other passages. Remember, Scripture interprets Scripture. Let the little children come to me. Okay? Uh, kingdom of God. And then he says, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall enter. How does a child receive the kingdom of God? Is it based on understanding, knowledge? Okay? Yeah, it's, it's, it's simple trust. It's, it's just simple trust. Right? That's why we teach our kids, you know, stranger danger, right? Don't go talking with strangers. Don't waddle off, you know, in the, in the grocery store. You know, stay close to mommy or daddy, right? Um, because children are just, just inherently, naturally, you know, very trusting. And so receiving the child like a, uh, like a, the kingdom of God like a little child is, is means just letting God do his work. You see? It's just, it's just letting God do his work. And then look at the next one. And he took them in his arms. It doesn't say then they jumped into his arms. Jesus took them. Holds them. Blesses them. Right? So we bring our children to be baptized in the same way. Oh, well they, I don't know if they're going to want to have this done to them. Jesus says, 
one, they're sinful, we're going to get to this in a second, they need it, but two, bring them to me, okay, bless them, I'm going to give them these gifts, okay, they might reject them down the road, I hope they don't, because someone can reject all this, someone who's been raised in the faith can pull a Judas or a King Saul, throw it all away, pull a Monty Python and run away, run away, right, <laughs> um, I mean, that, that, that can happen. But that's why at baptism, you know, we ask the parents, you know, to, you know, to, to, to promise and the sponsors, the godparents, to raise them in the faith, okay? And when they get old enough now to be able to speak with their own mouth, that's what confirmation's all about. So on April 10th, we're going to have 13 6th, 7th, and 8th graders who are going to publicly confirm that this faith was given to them in their baptism and that they now want to live in this faith because confessing with your mouth when you're, when you're able to is important, we're not saying that that's not important, okay? And then making a promise, you know, to be a Christian, to grow in the church, that they're old enough to understand these things and to be considered no longer children, but now young adults, okay? And, and not just a rite of passage, but now confessing with your mouth, believing with your heart that Jesus is Lord, right? And that's all, all part of the form of faith as well, okay? Look at Matthew 18, verse 6. I'm going to just roll through these and then we'll break. <coughs> Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. This is, this is Jesus. I thought we covered this one already. I apologize. I have too many Bible studies on my brain. Um, the little ones here, the Greek word is padaya. This is a child that can be bounced upon a knee. So you're really talking, I stopped bouncing my kids on the knee when they were probably five. Four, five, six. I've got big boys. <laughs> Maybe some smaller kids could be bounced on the knee, but it, you know, you know what you do? You sit in the chair, and, ah, you know, ride oh, the horsey, you know, and, horsey. And, and you're kind of holding them and that sort of thing. Um, and he's saying, whoever causes one of these who believe in me, so one, these little ones can have faith, and two, he says they can sin. This passage, in, in my opinion, quite simply, and obviously there's others, puts to rest the whole question of, well, these little kids aren't really accountable before God yet. And that's the whole age of accountability, which gets into the whole born-again question. That you now you need to be you need to be born again. Now raise your hand if you're baptized. You were born again when you were baptized. Born of water and the spirit. So I would say to you from Scripture, being born again simply means to be baptized regardless of how old you are when it happened. Just on the basis of Scripture. Okay? All right, Titus 3, 5 to 7. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, mm -hmm. by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is part of the reason that <clears throat> at least our denomination requires our pastors to learn Greek and learn Hebrew, learn the original languages. Because when you learn the original languages of Scripture, you see some things that you don't always see in translations. And this is one of those texts. Titus 3, verse 5. Look at the water words. This is water language. The words that are used here are connected um, <laughs> to water. So the washing of regeneration, right? The renewal of the Holy Spirit. And then look at verse 6. The pouring out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So this passage here from Titus with water language, just as Jesus is using water in, in John 3, Okay, uh, with Nicodemus, water in the spirit, this is all baptismal, sacramental language. That's actually just amazing. He saved us, again, not because of works done by us. It's not like he gave us the power and we did this in righteousness. It all starts with him. It all comes from him. It's all according to his own mercy, in case you're still questioning. You know, Jesus kind of reiterates himself. All right, and how did this happen? You've been washed. And in that washing and baptism, there's regeneration. It's a sacramental, it's a mi mystery, if you might say. Right? It's a regeneration, it's a renewal. And it's been poured out. Right? So that's why we, we will pour water on the forehead through Jesus Christ our Savior. 
Okay? And by the way, 75% of Christians throughout the world still today practice infant baptism. Just so you know. That many people, just from reading Scripture. Not just Lutherans. And then historically as well. Okay? Um, and, and, and even just the pouring of water on the forehead. Um, but poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, so that having been justified, remember again the form of faith, justified by His grace, we might become heirs. So now in the washing and the pouring, there's inheritance, okay? With the assurance, the hope of eternal life. Okay? Let's stop there. <laughs> okay? Go get, take a break, stretch your legs, grab coffee, get a cookie, and we'll reconvene here in three to five minutes or so. <clears throat> Baptism tonight. Welcome back, everybody. So we are on page uh, 49, and question for us is, what distinction is made in baptizing? Uh, see Matthew 18, and the simple answer is, let's read it together. Infants are baptized first, then taught. Adults are taught first, then baptized. Why? Let's look at some scripture. Uh, who's up for Acts 2, verse 41? So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added... That day about 3, okay, so there's now, um, for those that received now the word, that clung to it, um, so that's, that's a great, uh, uh, you know, 3,000, that's a lot of baptisms uh, that took place there. Acts 8, this is the Ethiopian eunuch, um, you know, a, a, a eunuch was, was really a type of wise man, not in a godfather, you know, sort of way, uh, but somebody who was, was very intelligent, learned, and studied that was basically in servitude to uh, nobility, to a king or to a queen, and the servitude it extends, extended so far that they would even have their, um, at least for males, eunuchs, their male parts cut off. Okay, So this is an uh, uh, Egyptian eunuch here, the Ethiopian eunuch, who is riding along in his chariot, and I'll give you the background of the story real quick. God told Philip to go and walk along this road, and as he does, there's a chariot with an Ethiopian eunuch, and the Ethiopian eunuch is reading from the scrolls of Isaiah. Okay? Um, but God sends Philip, uh, you know, to go be there, and tells him now to, you know, to talk to this person. So this is where it picks up. Uh, who are we next here for Acts 8? And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? about himself or about someone else. And I'm going to interrupt you because I should have told you a little bit more of the story. So <laughs> Philip walks up by the chariot and says, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch, who's a very wise, intelligent person, says, how can I understand unless somebody teaches me? I've tried to get my boys to say that all the time. They're not quite there yet. <laughs> they think they know everything. Okay, But usually a wise person will be willing to learn and hear what you have to say um, and that's what the, the, the Ophium eunuch invites him up, right? Um, and, uh, uh, and, and now Philip, um, <laughs> well, let's just go on from there. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is, the, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. Yeah, really amazing. So, so the eunuch, by the way, is reading from the scroll of Isaiah. Is Jesus mentioned in Isaiah? No, not by name. Is Jesus in Isaiah? You betcha. He's the Word, the Logos. And so Philip now, in explaining what he's reading, which is the book of Isaiah from the Old Testament, this is form of faith, folks. It's exactly what this is. This is Jesus who says, all scripture testifies to me. So Philip uses an Old Testament book of Isaiah to tell him the good news and the gospel of Jesus. And he obviously mentions or teaches about baptism. How do we know that? The eunuch now, wow, now that he's heard all these things, I believe this. Yeah. Is there any reason I can't be baptized? And obviously Philip has spent some time with him. His faith is solid, right? It's, it's there. And so he's baptized, right? Just an amazing story, okay? And I've only experienced it, you know, kind of, I guess, like this maybe a few times 
except God didn't like tell me to go there or be there. He might have designed some of it. Um, Acts 16. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Background to the story. Paul and Silas are in jail. All right? And God gets them out of jail in a really amazing way. There's an earthquake and all this other stuff. The jailer comes back to the jail. Guess who's still sitting there in jail with the doors wide open? Paul and Silas. They, they didn't do the jail break. They just stayed there. Okay? Pretty amazing. But now look what happens. Okay, go on from here. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them <coughs> the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once. He and all his family. So look at what happens. Paul and Silas are in jail. Okay, There's a jail break provided by God. Paul and Silas don't leave. The jailer's worried that it's going to be off with his head because he's in charge of the inmates. right? So he's trembling with fear. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to you know, be you know, killed. Yeah, they are. They're still there. And, and you know, he, uh, all the events, the events unfold. It's miraculous. Paul and Silas are still there. You know, what must I do to be saved? And they said, now, what do you have to do? Have faith. That's belief. Have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Have faith and you will be saved. And not just you, but this gift is for who? Even your whole family. Okay? And then look at verse 32. A lot of people miss this. And they spoke the word of the Lord. They taught the word of the Lord. Okay? Um, now, this might have been in some sort of a condensed format. But there's catechesis, just like you've been going through. There's instruction, connecting of dots, form of faith. And not only did they do that to just the jailer, the jailer obviously took them to his house or had all of his house household there. Now, if he's a jailer, he probably lived right next door. And I'm not going to get into the archaeology because it's really interesting um, how some of this was set up. We'll save that for another time, okay? But now the whole household now is taught, okay? Um, and he took them the same hour and he washed their wounds, cleaned them up, okay? And then he was baptized at once, and not just him, he and all his family. Okay? So, all his family. Grandma and Grandpa could have been there. He might have had kids, might have had grandkids, we don't know. We don't know who the family was, but Scripture, again, doesn't differentiate. So, pretty cool. Questions? Did you oh. take them back to jail? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so, because after that, they, 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 they went on from there. I'm not sure how that, how that worked out from there. But, um, you know, I mean, Paul obviously ends up being imprisoned in Rome for almost three years, and then is put to death by the Romans. Uh, that's where he wrote some of his most powerful letters that we have in the New Testament. Um, so, okay. But Paul, keep in mind, was a Roman citizen. So this is part of why God, um, you know, I think, well, definitely, and, and Paul alludes this, you know, called Paul to be an apostle. Paul had the ability to travel that some of the other apostles did not because they were, they were born Jewish um, and did not have that citizenship. So Paul had some unique, you know, visas, you might say. Okay? What is the benefit of baptism? Galatians 3. In Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Yeah. In Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Right? So we had a conversation way, way back at the beginning of class about who's the sons of God. Okay? And here's a great passage. Those that have faith. It's all through faith. So the true sons of God are those who have faith. Hebrews chapter 11 great passage in the Bible, and it goes through the Old Testament and the New Testament. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Enoch. By faith, and so on and so forth. And it names a bunch of different people from the Old and New Testament. The people in the Old Testament had the same faith, because so it was the gift of the Holy Spirit. Did they have the same knowledge? No. If you would have said the name Jesus Christ to Abraham, he would have looked at you um, 
Is he the guy who lives the next farm over? Okay, he would have known that name. But was the faith that he had in God the same faith the Holy Spirit brings to you? Yes, it was. Got it? Okay, so it's not just about knowledge, right? Greeks seek after, you know, knowledge, gnosis, okay? Jews look for miraculous signs, Paul writes. But we preach Christ crucified, stumbling block, right, to the Jews, hindrance, okay? All right, okay, Mark 16, verse 16, here's the passage I quoted earlier. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So to say that baptism does not do something, or that it's just your work, I'm just going to call it for what it is, is to be ignorant of what Scripture says. Okay? It really is. And I mean that in the kindest possible way. But as many of you as were baptized, Galatians 3, into Christ have put on Christ. So now in baptism, and we're going to get another passage, that you put on Christ, meaning clothed, covered, right, with his righteousness. And then Mark 16, 16, whoever has faith and is baptized will be saved. Period. That's the assurance. Okay? Um, but, however, whoever does not have faith, does not believe, will be condemned. 1 Peter 3, 21, top of page 50. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, <clears throat> not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So this baptism that we're talking about here, um, even while there is, you know, the baptizoing of pots and kettles, baptizoing with the name of God, the word of God, sacramental, mysterious baptism, is, is not about washing with soap and water, but it's now an appeal to God for good conscience, which means that you can stand before God knowing that your conscience is clean because you are judged according to Jesus. See the difference? Okay, Through faith, you can stand before God and say, my Savior has died for me. He has borne all of my sins, all the punishment, okay? And he, O oh God, has paid the price. And he's redeemed me, justified me, right? And so my conscience now is clean because Jesus did this. You see, that? that's, that's the appeal. And so baptism now saves you. Now, prior to this, it talks about just as Noah and his family, eight souls in all, were saved by means of the ark, so baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. That's why our baptismal font in the sanctuary has eight sides to it. It's also why the churches, traditionally, and even ours here, look a little bit like a boat on the inside, almost upside down, Okay, but where you sit is called the nave, N-A-V-E. That means hold of the boat. You are the precious cargo, in the okay, water. in God's boat in and water. water. That's right. Absolutely. The boat and the water. Yep. Yeah. Ephesians 5, 25 to 26. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, and they cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Husbands, you are called to a special vocation. Number one, die for your wife. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. Okay? And how did Christ love the church? He covered her. Okay? He certainly died for her, but he also covered her. He clothed her. Okay? Uh, this is embrace, this is protecting. This is watching over, providing a home. I mean, all of these things. And Jesus, or Paul here in Ephesians, connects that to baptism. So just as you are covered and assured of all these things in baptism with faith in Jesus, that's what a husband should strive for in providing and caring for his wife. It's pretty powerful when you stop and think about it. Not trying to scare off those that are getting ready to get married. Jesus will give you the help and strength you need. Okay? So, okay. <laughs> Romans 6, 4. Oh, that was me. 
we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Another amazing passage, again, mysterious and sacramental. Being baptized means that you now are buried with Jesus in the tomb. Specifically that your sins are buried. Why? Because just as Jesus rose from the dead on Easter Sunday, so you too, by the glory of the Father, might rise and walk in newness of life. That's why when we talk about baptism, all right, and, I mean, I've, I've talked to each one of you individually in some way, shape, or form, and I say, are you baptized? And you reply to me, yeah, Mark said it right. Okay. I am baptized. Not was. Because you live in your baptism daily. It's not just a one-time thing. Or as we were talking, Shane, something that needs to be repeated over and over again. I am baptized. This is my reality. I have been clothed with Christ. <laughs> right? And so uh, that's what it means to be a Christian. Christian literally means little Christ. That's what the word Christian means, to be a Christian. Okay, how can you be a little Christ? <laughs> Jesus stands for me. <laughs> and especially now in baptism, which is all, been all about Christianity, I am baptized, right? And so I'm robed with his righteousness. And so we die daily to our sins. We repent and then we are forgiven through Christ, and we, we, we strive with his help to overcome those things, to have the strength to deal with those things. All of us struggle with different temptations. Nothing, nothing is the same for each and every one of us. The devil, the world, our sinful nature is each trying to push our buttons in a different way. Okay? But we can relate all those to the Ten Commandments in some way, shape, or form. That's why that's an important form of faith that Jesus says, you know, yet stands for us. Okay? Uh, not abolished. He's fulfilled it, but it still stands. Okay? So I am baptized. Okay? Okay. Uh, summary, real quick. I always just kind of review this. In summary, why are infants, infants or pediah, which would include infants or children that are a little bigger, right? We wouldn't call a two year old an infant anymore. We'd call him a to toddler, a holy terror, or <laughs> why did we do this? <laughs> Okay, I love kids, don't get me wrong, I got, I got four of them, uh, we were supposed to have seven, we got three in heaven. Um, in summary, why are infants to be baptized? Number one, they're able to have faith. They're able to believe. How do we know that? Jesus said so. One of these little ones, Padaya, that, that believe in me. Okay, number two, they are sinful. How do we know that? Same passage, you know, Jesus says, you know, anyone who causes one of these who believe in me to sin. Okay, and not only that, we have all the other passages. And sin did my mother conceive me. And I was brought forth, you know, in iniquity. All of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. They're sinful. They need baptism just as you do, regardless of your age, 25, 35, 65, 75, 85, whatever it is. They're human beings as well, and they need baptism. And three, simple. They're included in God's command. Go and make disciples of... Adults who can read at a 11th grade level, or have a degree, or a full-time job. Jesus doesn't qualify in this. Make disciples of all nations. All means all. They're included in God's command. Okay? Uh, let's look at a few of the sheets following this, if you haven't already. So again, a review. So there's sacraments. So we see water. You see the baptismal font. Uh, the shell above it with three drops, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, and we're going to talk about communion. We haven't got to that yet. Okay, but a, a God's word is sacrament, a mystery instituted by God, that which God himself has joined his word of promise to a visible element, and that which God offers, gives, seals, gives the forgiveness of, of, uh, of grace, of sins earned by Christ. Those are also referred to next page as the means of grace. Okay. Uh, means um, the ways in which God now brings this grace, delivers these things to you. So you see there the Holy Spirit like a dove behind the cross. 
Okay, you see the Bible on the bottom. All of it comes from the Word. So that's why we refer to it as Word and Sacrament is the phrase that you'll hear. Uh, just a few more pages there on baptism, just to kind of review some of that. Um, nature of baptism, to wash with water combined with God's Word. Who is to be baptized? A little more information on that. Okay. Um, and one more that's added on this one. Um, why to baptize babies? Jesus especially invites them to come to him. <laughs> Love the little children come to me. So that would be a fourth one. Uh, what are the blessings of baptism in summary from all the scripture we looked at? And that was by no means exhaustive, by the way. Forgiveness of sins. So what does baptism do? It gives forgiveness of sins. Number two, rescues from death and the devil. And three, gives eternal salvation to all who have faith in this, who believe this. Okay? Uh, next page, power of baptism. So water then of word. This is the washing of rebirth. We covered this in Titus, the renewal. Okay? Uh, next page, what baptism indicates. Um, that uh, the old man is drowned daily, right? Buried with Christ. Dies with all sins and evil desires. So this is what we need to put the old man in us to death every day. And this is what God provides baptism for, that we would repent of our sins. And remember, repent uh, in Hebrew is the word sewer. It's a horrible smell. We stay away from it, right? We just can't stomach it. So that's what our sins are, we're, are supposed to do to us, that we don't walk in them anymore. We turn away once we've learned, okay? And, and, and they're, they're dead and buried. And now a new man daily emerges and arises to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. And all this, of course, done with God's name that he's given to us. Good little pamphlet there, the whatabouts. I hope you've enjoyed those uh, so far that have been provided for you. And then that's going to bring us next week to the Office of Keys and Confession. Okay? Now we've got two Wednesdays left after this. We have three lessons left in Form of Faith. So next week, I'm probably going to roll through the Office of the Keys fairly quickly. Um, so please make sure you read through this lesson with the accompanying information. And be prepared to bring any really deep or difficult challenges you have, okay? Um, if you're still at the point of, who does that pastor think he is? Jesus? He's forgiven me my sins? If you're still struggling with that, that's okay. Bring that question. We'll look at some scripture where Jesus now commands that to be done, okay? And then understand, as I've told you already, the pastors are just the mouthpiece, okay? In German, it's mouth house. Another word for pastors, mouth house, simply speaking God's word, means, okay? All right? Any questions before we close for tonight? Okay, I hope you learned a little something tonight, okay? Uh, reaffirm some of what may, uh, some of you may have learned already. Um, remember, if you do have further questions, you're struggling with something, don't hesitate to text me, email me, call me, and we'll work through some of those as well, Okay. Um, and I've got a, you know, I've got a pretty substantial library. Also over here, these good news magazines that are on the back. Um, there, there's one or two on baptism that are really, really good. Uh, plus, they have amazing artwork in them. You know, so <laughs> um, I like artwork. Okay, um, I'm not not a smart man, so uh, I don't mind pictures. Okay, good, good. Let's stand and close with the Lord's prayer, shall we? Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us again to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Peace be with you. And Last comment real quick. Um, if you are at the point, those of you that are not members already, that you do want to join, um, we're going to do that on April 10th. We'll be kind of confirmation, welcome into fellowship. If you haven't talked to me already, please do that. So I can give you just some information and kind of know where you're at. Okay. Um, and I'll try and ping all of you within, probably within the next week or so just to reach out. So that's it for now. Have a good night. Bye-bye.
Yeah. So pass.